Episode 243 of the Bevan James Isle Show, an interview with orthopaedic physical therapist Rick Alderman. Radio team, welcome along to episode 243 of the Bev and James I'll Show, your fortnightly podcast on the behaviours that create a lifetime love of exercise so you can get all the benefits that come alongside it. Uh, today I've got an interview with a guy by the name of Rick Alderman. He is a top level physio, orthopaedic physiotherapist and he's written some really interesting books and he's got, he's, he's this guy who basically thinks, well, his new methods to dealing with major injuries which are more about figuring out the structures of your life. And I'm going to be honest, it's a bit of a, a more of an injury focused technique, technical kind of podcast, which I don't tend to do on this podcast, but I did find them quite interesting. Um, so we'll be getting that coming up really soon. It'll be, uh, yeah, we'll be good to talk to him. I've got a couple of quick things I want to talk about before we put the interview on. First of all, um, massive thank you. <laughs> I know I've been talking about the book like recently, but it's kind of the big thing in my life right now. But the other day, I, on Friday, the book, we released the book on Audible, Mm, when was that? That was maybe two weeks ago. It came out on Audible about two weeks ago. And it uh, came out on Audible. I didn't really think much of it. And then last week, uh, or maybe Tuesday, I checked on Audible and it was in the top 50 in the world. And I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, like to be in the top 50 books on Audible in the world for fitness and exercise was a pretty cool achievement. And then on Friday, I jumped on Audible and the book got to top, it's top 10. Now, I don't know. These things go up and down. I don't know exactly where it is right now. And it was basically Tom Brady was number nine, I was number ten. Like my book, you know, this guy from New Zealand, and my book has got to number ten for fitness and exercise books in the whole wide world and Audible. And uh, one thing I've got to say, which is a little bit frustrating, is because the way it works, I don't actually know how many books I've sold on Audible because unfortunately you don't get a report for like two months after the fact. So I won't know until September how many we're selling right now, but. I just want to say a massive thank you to you guys because I know, A, basically, in the first moment of the book coming out, the, the sales that we would have got was the people who knew me, you know, and the idea was that what, what now we want to do is to spread it to people who don't know me so we can get more people moving, but um, it was it was a really mind-blowing moment in my life. It was a real moment of pride. Um, I was a bit overwhelmed by it, um, you know, as, as we went to bed that night, because it's just been, as I talk about my book, it's been Joe and my project, Joe's, Joe's worked so hard, and I was just like, babe, the whole wide world, and all the audiobooks on fitness and health in the whole wide world, to be in the top 10, we could have never hoped for better. And the book's gone so well in New Zealand, like it's it's still selling really well, which is really encouraging. Um and even yesterday, a guy I was talking to yesterday said I was talking to his PT, and his PT um, used a quote from my book and recommended the book to, to spread it to people in his life. And this is what this is about. This book is for people who aren't exercising, and it's the kind of book we want you to recommend. So I just want to say I want to share that proud moment for you. For those who have got the book, good. Oh, thank you so much. One thing I do ask, if you could please, please, please put a review on Amazon or Audible, That'd be really great because let's be honest, online that's where most books sell. Um, and you know, like I'm in the top ten, but at the moment I think I've only got three reviews, and they rate great reviews. But yeah, I think reviews give credibility. So if you, if you're listening to us right now, if you could just pause this show and literally spend a couple minutes writing a review, um, it'd be really appreciated because that would just help to get more people to get the book. So so I just want to say a massive thank you there. One other quick thing I do want to talk about before we get Rick on the show is last time I was talking about how you get people to recommend my book to people who aren't exercising without offending them. And it was really interesting because I was talking to a girl at the gym who, who's also a fitness instructor. She doesn't teach at my gym, but she is a fitness instructor. And she was saying she had a friend who was an exerciser, had a kid, fell away from exercise, and now is kind of, you know, in a place where struggling with the health and fitness. And she recommended the book to her friend, and her friend got offended by it. Her friend was like, "What are you, what are you saying?" And it was, and and th- this girl I was talking to was saying it was really tough because I was genuinely coming from a place of caring. Um, you know, I was really trying to help somebody. It, it wasn't judgmental. I was just trying to, hey, yeah, I know you liked the exercise in the past. I'm trying to get you back to this place. And it's just, it's a really interesting thing. Now, I, I, I don't want that to be a discouragement for you. I do want you to recommend my book to the people in your world. Um, 
And maybe the best way is, is maybe send a link to something that I've done, maybe a podcast or um, say, hey, this guy does a great book, maybe check out his podcast or something like that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting how vulnerable people are around exercise, even when we can provide them with good solutions. So, yeah, fascinating stuff. Anyway, I'm going to get into the main gist of the show, but before I do, I want to say a massive thank you to the patrons of the show. These are the people who give some of their hard-earned money each time I release an episode of this podcast. Now, if you want to become a patron, just go to bevanjamesisles.com, look on podcast, click on patron or support me and they'll take you on through to my patreon page once you're in there it's pretty simple just go through the process and then you know you, you just support the show now when you become a patron you also get a cool bevan james i'll show nickname basically i'll make up a little nickname for you and uh yeah and these are some of the people who are patrons and these are some people who have nicknames so right up to the top of my list i've got paula the powerful Punisher Green. We've got Marion Clatt. She's the momentum. We've got George, the wild bull baker. We've got Mary. I've got the power. And we've got Phoebe, the Stark Sanders. Thank you for those people who are patrons. If you want to become a patron of the show, go to bevanjamesisles.com. Go through the process. Anyway, here's my interview right now. Right here, I'm very happy to have on the show a man by the name of Rick Alderman. He is the author of the Fixing You series, which is basically pretty technical books on how to fix yourself if you've got certain pains, certain problems in your body. And I like the thing I like about the books are they're very specific to the needs of the problems. Uh, so he's got the neck and pain and headaches, he's got the back pain and so on. So welcome to the show, Rick. Thanks, Bevan. Thanks for being here. So I suppose give me a little bit of an overview of, of what you're about and what your mission is. Yeah. Uh, well, what I'm about, I'm a physical therapist and I've been a physical therapist for about 25 years. I kind of became a physical therapist after suffering from my own back pain. Uh, I got into PT school to kind of learn, you know, what the insider secrets were. And I quickly found that there weren't any insider secrets. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I'm, looking for, so, I'm looking for the heavens and they're not there. <laughs> exactly. I said, I can uh, learn it straight from the horse's mouth. And uh, so really in, in medicine and PT school, uh, specifically, we're really focused on understanding which structures are painful and identifying those structures. So we have a million tests for these kinds of things, yeah. but we don't have any tests for understanding why those structures are painful. Okay. Nothing. And so this bore out in my first job after PT school, where I was good with sprains and strains and surgery kind of stuff. But anyone who came in with chronic issues, back pain, foot pain, neck pain, whatever, I had no clue. Because we did, we were taught to address tissue problems, okay. not understand why they were happening. And that turns out to be the key that's been missing, I feel. So mm. that's what I've been looking into these past 25 years and solving. So I suppose, let's, you know, it's, it's interesting because this kind of, there's two types of audience this will talk to, kind of be the hardcore athlete and maybe the regular fitness person. And then those who kind of maybe don't have much exercise in their life. So you know, what are some of the common causes you see for pain? Because I think what we're really addressing here is not just kind of the, you know, you fall over and break your leg or, or roll your ankle stuff. It's more that kind of long-term pain. So what what do you think are the main causes that, that people that create this? Yeah, so uh, let's, let's go specifically into one type of pain. Probably yeah. most of your listeners have back pain. Okay. All right. So that's an easy one. So let's go ahead. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll demonstrate yeah. by sh- taking them through a little test. Okay. Okay. So all of you listening at home, go ahead and lie down on the floor with your legs straight. And you can lie down on a couch. If, if it's hard to get down on the floor, you can lie down on your bed. It doesn't really matter. But lie down on your floor. And I'd really like you to do this because if you just listen to my words and you're going to say, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But if you feel it in your body, then you know it's true. Okay. And this is what I want you to feel. So you're lying down on the floor, preferably a firm surface. Your legs are straight. And I want you to feel how your low back feels in this situation. And uh, now you're going to bend your knees and you're going to put your feet flat on the floor. Or if you prefer, you can hug your knees to your chest, whatever feels best to you. And you're going to compare how your back feels to your with your knees bent versus when your legs were straight. And if you need to check that again, straighten your legs, see if it still is achy there and bend your knees, see if it still feels better. So uh, most people doing this test, almost all of them will find that their back feels better when their knees are bent. So real simple, what are we figuring out here? 
all we're understanding is that your back feels better when there's less arch in it or less forces trying to pull it into an arch. So you'll notice that when your feet are straight, your back is arching more. When your knees are bent, your back is flatter into the ground. Simple as that. No complicated stuff going on here. So what we're doing when we're bending your knees is we're, we're, we are removing all of the forces that are trying to pull your back into that arch. That's why your back feels better. So how does this play out in real life? Well, if you all stand up now and listen to this podcast, what, we'll, what you'll notice is that you tend to lock your knees straight. It's a habit that most people have developed. So notice this, whether this is happening for you. Now, feel what your back feels like standing here listening to this podcast. Now I'm going to ask you just to soften your knees just a tad and feel what just happened to your low back uh, discomfort <clears throat> or pain there. And now if you're not sure, go ahead and lock your knees again. And when you lock your knees, you're going to notice that when you're locking your knees, your back is more arched. And when you soften your knees, your back is less arched. Simple as that. What, why does this matter? Well, on the floor, you just found out that when your back is more arched, you have more back pain. And now you just found out that one of your habits that you have when standing is to lock your knees. Mm -hmm. And so one of the habits that you have unconsciously is contributing to your back pain. And softening the knees is an easy way to change that habit. You've got to change these habits that are beating up your body and hammering places on your body that you're unaware of. So all of these habits are unconscious. They're normal habits. Your brain, is its job is to get from A to B as efficiently as possible. You've trained it to do that. It's going to do it the way that you've taught it to do it. You've taught it to do, do it. But your brain doesn't understand that how it's organizing these things for you is actually contributing to your body pain. So what my programs do and what I do in my books and do in my clinic is teach people these connections not only fixing the tighter, weak muscles that result from this, yeah. but changing the habits that are driving the pain and the tighter, weak muscles. Mm, okay. So it's creating a foundation of understanding of where you're subconsciously almost working against your body and giving you the tools and understanding of what you need to do to prevent the, the long-term, the, the causes that could come from that in the long-term. Correct. Okay. And, yeah. um, and, for most people, is it, is it like is it a pretty easy fix, or like you know, I, I obviously we're doing you know, we're doing a broad area here, but you know, like is it is it really as simple as learning to bend your knees, like or like is it much more you know, like give me more detail? It, it can be so simple. I'll, I'll just give you one real fast example. I had a collegiate Division One swimmer. Uh, <clears throat> she had 15 years of back pain. She was top of the food chain in the best school in the nation. Okay. Had to leave the program from back pain. No one could help her on all, all of the medical staff. 15 years later, she walks into my clinic with plantar fasciitis. Okay. And big she, for runners she was, as well. Yes. Yeah. And so she didn't even, uh, she completely gave up on her back pain. Okay. So she's walking in my, in my, in my clinic and she's like closing her eyes and breathing really hard. Try, just trying to get to my table. I said, wow, that plantar fasciitis must really be bothering you. She says, oh, that's, that's not what's killing me. It's my back. But you can't help me with that. I'm here mm -hmm. for my plantar fasciitis. Okay. Well, nothing gets my hackles up more than someone who tells me I can't help it, right? <laughs> so, so I said, well, tell me a little bit more about it. So anyway, uh, I, she was in so much pain, I couldn't even evaluate her. However, what I noticed, I, all I needed to, to see was what I saw from her walking to my table. She was locking her knees when she was walking. I just simply put a couple pieces of tape on the backs of her knees to get her to stop doing that one habit. Just that, that's the only thing we did. Three days later, she came back 75% better. Not only back pain, but also plantar fasciitis. So when you, so things can be very simple. It's not always that simple, yeah. but it, it, it can be much simpler. So when people like her, she had chronic back pain for 15 years, 75% gone in three days. It can be that simple if you strike on the right thing. Yeah. Now we're not going to always strike on the right thing right off the bat. Yeah. But if you've had pain for 20 years, it doesn't mean you, it's going to take 20 years to fix it. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of fixing systems in the body rather than treating tissues. And so uh, I approach things from solving system problems that I see, which at, from her example, you can see if you fix one thing, it has massive wow. ripple effects through yeah. the rest of the body and as it did with hers. And so 
you know, because obviously you would be recommending people to go see professionals at certain levels. So, you know, like with your books, is it very much just kind of helping people figure out the framework, you know, some things to explore? And then if it does get to that next level or they don't feel they're making progress, they work with professionals or, or like, you know, where do you sit with that? Yeah. So uh, most of the people who buy my books or who purchase my downloadable home programs have mm-hmm. already been to a lot of professionals yeah, like this person. Yeah. So they've already gone down those roads. So my books and programs, home programs, target people with chronic pain. Okay. And the reason they're having chronic pain, whether regardless of whether they're working with a professional or not, uh, the reason they're having chronic pain is because none of the professionals are trained to understand this, the body as a system. Yeah. We're trained in this component thinking, like in my PT school. Yeah. And so it's like looking at a pixel and trying to understand the whole picture from a pixel. Yeah. You, you, you just can't. You have, and so there's nothing in our training that's putting things back together again into the system. Mm. They're just leaving all of that up to us. Well, you guys just put this little piece into your and, you know, try and use it in treatment. Some, no. We have to be taught how it fits into our system. And so uh, people can work with a professional, of course. Uh, but my theory and the way I practice is that you should be able to fix your pain. And I, I give you the tools to do that. So I suppose, so when we think about the base camp, or oh, base camp, but the baseline, what, what's the first signs of awareness people need to have? Because obviously, let's say you've got back pain, Um and a lot of people live with back pain, let's be honest. Uh, yeah. And and it's kind of a presence in their life, isn't it? It's just kind of mm-hmm. this presence that sits in their life for a long period of time. Um, obviously, you want to hit it early. So mm-hmm. what, what are the signs that you need to be working, you know, moving towards, you know, something like what you offer in, in, in regards to actually taking action? Because, you know, I think a lot of people kind of go, well, this is just my life from here on forward, you know, or it's not that bad yet, which is a big problem that people have with injuries is that they kind of, you know, uh, you know, I'm feeling a little bit tight. I'll just keep on pushing through. So what are some of the things that people do that work against them? And what are the, what's the mindset they need to have around this? Well, just, just what you just said is, is really it, you know, so we, we, so we, we unfortunately wait until there's a huge catastrophe before we decide that it's time to take action. Yeah. So I'm not going to try and convince people who are used to saying, Oh, I'll just work through it. It'll be gone in a week or two. And you know, or I'll just do this one little treatment and it'll be gone for a week or two and I'll be good to go. Well, that works for a little while, but uh, if you're not solving the reasons why this is all happening, that's going to become more and more frequent. It's going to get harder and harder to solve, and it's going to last longer and longer. Mm. So there's nothing I can say in this podcast that will convince people to take action. Their own pain will force them to take action. And so if you are having chronic pain, most people become very skeptical because they've been to a ton of different practitioners and no one's been able to solve their pain. And so they think, I'm just going to have to live with this. Mm. But I'm, I'm telling your listeners right now, it's because they don't understand or they haven't treated you from a systems standpoint. That is what is causing the chronic pain. They're not linking those unconscious habits you have during the day with your pain. And this is what you've been missing. How do people work against themselves with this? You know, like when they do have pain, how do you find yeah. people generally work against themselves? With uh, who have pain, did yeah, you say, or yeah, hip pain? Yeah, no, just yeah. So, pain. yeah. So, well, the first thing is to ignore it. Yeah. Right. But the other thing is, is that un- unfortunately, for instance, I just had an email from a, a, a woman just a, a couple of days ago. She said, oh, I've got this terrible pain on, on my back. You know, it's on my right side. I, I just can't get rid of it, blah, blah, blah. And I said, uh, well, likely you have a side bending problem. And uh, it's usually due to some problem in that leg. She says, I have no history of problems in my leg at all. There's no reason I should have this side bending problem. And I can explain to you what that is. And so we went back and forth like this for a couple of times. I said, I'm sorry, you have a side bending problem and it's due to some problem in your leg. That's all there is to it. And finally, she got back to me. She said, oh my God, I can't believe I forgot this. I've been dealing with a hamstring tear on that side for the last 10 years. I said, whatever is causing that chronic hamstring issue is now also causing your back pain. She's like, I've never linked those two things together before. And that was a beautiful example of how out of left field this thinking is for people. It's hard for people to connect their own old histories 
with their current pain. Mm. Because we're taught that our ankle pain is about our ankle, maybe our knee, but certainly Mm. not my back, Mm. you know, and same with a knee issue or hip issue or whatever. I can't tell you how many people's back pain are due to hip issues Mm. or walking patterns, Mm. things like that. So it's not that so much that people are working against themselves. It's that the information they've received about their issues is not including these old issues. Not many therapists want to delve back into old problems that you've had, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, let's just, let's just fix this one. You know, we'll save that one for later, but I'm sorry. No, anything that you've had in your lower body system is a potential culprit for your current back pain now or mm-hmm. static pain or whatever it is. Do you see um, the, the difference between general population and athletes and, and maybe even particularly like in stream endurance athletes, you know, like do you see, uh, you know, because obviously the demand on the body is completely different. Um, and, and, with, and, you know, let's say high level endurance athletes, they're very fit people. They have very good frames, mm-hmm. uh, but they're often the muscle imbalances and all the rest of it. So do you sure. see, do you see, is it a similar pathway? Is it similar problems or is it, are there actually differences in what, what you have to address for these p- different types of populations? It's identical pathways and identical problems. The oh, really? problem is the endurance athlete has higher volume. Mm. Uh, apply to their pathways. So if you have, uh, and, and also an endurance athlete will sometimes have to get a little bit more precise with our fix with an endurance athlete, because a small change when you're a cyclist and you have 300,000 revolutions that you're doing in a day, well, if, if there's a, I, I won't go into, I won't geek out on any terms <laughs> or anything like that. But if, if you have a small anomaly and, and how that is going based on how your body is built, then that is magnified by those 300,000 revolutions that you're performing yeah. on your bike or steps that you're taking on your marathon training or whatever. So it is the same ex- identical pathways. It's just the consequences, the volume makes a, a huge difference. Thankfully though, with endurance athletes, they respond very quickly to small nudges in the right direction because their bodies are already so strong, usually fairly flexible. They've got great nutrition. And a lot of them are already geared to thinking mechanically. Yeah. And that's, they, they instantly grasp this kind of information because it's like, got it. Oh, it's this that's causing it. Yes. And this is what you do about it. Got it. I'm going to do that. And boom, pain goes away. Mm. One thing, you know, like, uh, you know, I coach running and, and yeah. one thing I find uh, with injury management is people are really good until the moment it starts to feel good. And then they slacken off on doing the work. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, they might do, you know, get some advice and it actually helps. And then they get to that moment where it feels good and they either lessen the amount of work it takes to get it right or they stop doing the work. Is that something you find? And if so, what would be your advice around that? Yeah, so I (laughs) I don't find that too often personally. Okay. Uh, The reason I don't find that too often personally is because I spend time with my patients teaching them the link between their mechanics this tight or weak muscle and their pain. And so uh, instead of just giving them a stretch to do that, this takes away your pain temporarily. I also teach them, look, your running pattern of doing this is why this tight or weak muscle is happening. Mm -hmm. And so the more that they fix those mechanical habits, the less that tight or weak muscle, they have to take time out to do that stretch or whatever, or maybe they have to do a whole routine to stay, you know, good and Mm -hmm. and pain-free. Well, that whole routine is necessary because they haven't solved the mechanical causes of the things that you're trying to fix with that whole r- mm, routine. Mm. So I find huge buy-in. I, I get this question from a lot of therapists. They're just like, well, how do you get people to, to do what you're asking them to do? Well, I always do test retest immediately that first day in the clinic. We show them that it reduces their pain. And I don't bother them with anything that's not reducing pain by at least 30 to 50%. Mm. So we're going to do very, be very specific. We're going to solve the problem. And then now that you see that this is a big cause of your pain, you're going to do it. And the motivation is through the roof because no one wants to be in pain, especially in an endurance athlete. You know, mm-hmm. they want to be competing. So mm-hmm. I don't really run into that problem personally that much, yeah. but I know a lot of therapists do. And reason. even with the general population, they're still pretty motivated as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. No one wants to be in pain. Yeah. The, the, I, I believe that the motivation happens because, to, at least in physical therapy, what, what we traditionally do is 
throw a thousand exercises at people and say, do these exercises. And then, yes, if I do those thousand exercises, my pain will go down. But do I have to do a thousand exercises for the rest of my life? That's ridiculous. You Mm -hmm. shouldn't have to. So I think there's some non-specificity going on with our exercise prescription, which frustrates the, the consumer. We don't, no one wants to spend an hour a day trying to fix their pain all the time, every day for the rest of the life. That's ridiculous. So why not fix the reasons all of those things are happening so that it becomes an unconscious movement habit? And then you don't have the t- tighter, weak muscles forming because you fix the reason it's happening. Are there ever times when you can't fix it? Rarely. Okay. The only times I can't, see, I can't fix something is usually if there is a structural issue going on that I can't overcome. Okay. And even some structural issues I can overcome, like you know, mild to moderate stenosis, spondylolisthesis, disc bulges, disc herniations, things like that. But sometimes those things have gone, gotten to the point, they've gotten okay. to a degree where you, you just can't overcome, no matter how much you fix the system, that structural issue is there. Now we're down to that structural issue. Yeah. The nice thing about that, though, is that the outcomes from surgeries and procedures are so much more successful yeah. because you fix the system that, in my belief, caused those structural issues in the first place. So now that you fix the system that will be using that body that's been surgically repaired, the outcomes become greater and more successful. Mm. Um, any, any other any other kind of problems you see with people who do come into injuries? Um, you know, any, anything else you want to kind of touch on? Well, I, you know, I I think in terms of injuries, uh, pain is a is a symptom, and it's telling you that something is wrong with your body now. Yeah. So it, more and more, if you read the papers and and uh, all these articles about chronic pain more and more uh, writers are defining chronic pain as a disease. That really disturbs me because mm-hmm. chronic pain, I don't believe is a disease. It's our lack of understanding of what's happening. And because we can't solve it and many people can't solve it, they then assume that there is a systemic issue going on here. It must be a disease of some sort. Okay. Uh, that is not the truth. The, the, that is not the reality of things. It's just that we don't know how to solve it, mm-hmm. but I, I, the key is understanding why it's there in the first place. And now that's an overused term because every practitioner thinks that they're solving the root cause. No practitioner will ever say, eh, I'm not going to solve the root cause. I'm just going to do this little treatment. Yeah. Everyone thinks they're causing the root, root cause or solving the root cause, but I don't believe it's truly happening. And that's why people are having chronic pain. What about the use of drugs? Because I imagine a lot of people are using drugs to disguise pain. Um, you know, and, and in some ways, if the drugs are working, it it allows them to avoid doing, you know, confronting it. Um, You know, is that something you see a lot? I wouldn't say a lot. Um, My, you know, I always talk about that with my patients. Look, do you want to continue taking these drugs? Most of them don't want to. Mm. So I say, okay, our first goal will be then to reduce your drugs by half. Yeah. And then we're going to reduce it by a hundred percent. So, but we're not going to do that if we haven't solved the reason that they're having pain. Yeah. So there's a trust issue that, has to be developed with the patient to say, you know, hey, I trust that you know what you're talking about. And usually even if people are taking drugs, they know whether they have pain or not. Yeah. So once we remove that, then they feel more confident to stop taking their drugs. Okay. Uh, so first, we have to do our job first as a therapist to fix the pain mm-hmm. rather than getting them to, to stop their drugs first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just you know, like as I know, a lot of athletes will on a race day use drugs and stuff like you know if they're really injured and, and stuff like that. And yes. you know, you know, not not performance enhancing, but just you know to right. you know to to get through a race, get you know. through. Yeah, yeah, you know, and exactly. And I'm sure it's actually quite. I would be honest. I don't know if there's much study done around that, but I'd be fascinated to know what the case. How many people are actually using some kind of anti flam or something like that in in a race environment to get them through an injury that they're working through? It'd be fascinating to know. I would think it would be very high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> you know, be surprised. Yeah. There's a lot of unsolved injuries out there. People were struggling. Mm. This is what this is what really struck me when I, I fr- had my first PT job. I was out in this remote town in southwestern Colorado, and I was failing. I was just failing. I was embarrassed to be a PT. I was embarrassed to go out in public. There was only one supermarket in town, and I would 
almost disguised myself going in because I, you know, there was all these patients that I wasn't helping. I'm just like, God, I'm just terrible. And then I moved to Denver where there's this huge, yeah. you know, network of, you know, elite professionals. And I worked at this athletic club for a while and I, you know, started working with people and instantly my schedule was full of all of these people, athletes, non-athletes alike, who had this chronic pain. And it showed me in all of my, whenever I speak at conferences, anytime I speak on back pain or neck pain or hip pain, I have standing room only. Really? So no. it, it showed me, it's not because I'm a great speaker. Mm. It's because there's, there's an aid. legions of people with chronic issues out here that we have not been doing a good job of in medicine. Mm. And I think I have a, a new answer for it. So that helped massage my ego a little bit to tell me, hey, okay, you're bad, but maybe you're not as bad as you thought you were. <laughs> um, what, what kind of timeframes do you usually see for people to go from like where they are to seeing progress to seeing maybe getting over it? Yeah, it, it takes, it depends on the type of injury yeah, of that's course. going on, but yeah. let's go back to back pain. So uh, in my, or chronic neck pain or anything like that. So uh, I expect at least 30 to 50% reduction in pain after my first visit with someone. Oh, wow. Okay. And I, the reason I expect that is because during my evaluation, I've already done my test retest to know exactly what, the, what is causing their pain. Okay. And I've given them the things to solve that. So I should see whatever they've achieved in that session, they should be able to maintain. Usually that's the case. If it's like 10 or 20%, if they say, ah, I'm 10 or 20% better, then I think they're just trying to save my feelings okay. and not make me feel bad. Okay. Right? Yeah. I don't yeah. believe my, and I tell them that straight off. I said, look, you're not We're here not to make end. me feel better. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm here to get you better. So be honest with me. And then there's like, okay, yeah, it's maybe five or 10%. Percent. So that tells me that then we're on the wrong track. So I can quickly shift gears because in my examination, because I'm, for instance, back pain, looking at everything from the rib cage down to the foot, I've already identified perhaps seven or 10 different things that are causing this issue. The first one or two things I've addressed isn't doing it. Then we go to the next set of things. And so I can easily and quickly work down the list. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like you, you know, you you you, you say, like you're talking about how you know you found this kind of different way of approaching things, and maybe as an industry that needs to move forward. How are you finding? Do you find resistance from the industry, and how are you trying to influence the industry? And and so there is this different way of approaching things. Yeah. So so uh, this is a really good question, and uh, yes, there is resistance. Yeah. So uh, one of the people I've learned from in terms of connecting movement and pain is Dr. Shirley Saruman. She has a series of seminars and courses that I took at, at her university at Washington U in uh, St. Louis. I made friends with a PT. And I, at the last course I took, I ran into him again. I said, Hey, how's the information going for you? And he says, eh, you know, I said, what are you talking about? I mean, I'm getting people better faster than ever. And he's just like, yeah, but I'm a manual therapist. So this doesn't really go for me. Okay. Maybe I'll use it for some home exercise programs or something like that. And that's when it clicked to me that we are all as practitioners looking at things through a belief system. And so he is automatically filtering out the possibility of biomechanics as a cause of pain because he prefers to do manual therapy on someone. Okay. And so that's when I realized that I had to, that's when I wrote my books is because I needed to do an end around the practitioners and all of their belief systems about what should or shouldn't work because their patients were missing this value, this information. And so the resistance isn't this uh, conspiracy theory yeah. kind of th resistance. It's a resistance based on belief systems and how we're trained in physical therapy. And so this happens in law. It happens in any, any career. Mm -hmm. We all develop a belief system of how things should be. But if you're not open to seeing through that belief system to other possibilities, then, you know, that's, that's where the resistance is that I'm coming from is this desire not to look through their belief systems mm -hmm. and embrace something new that may require a bit more work on their part. And, and are you having influence? Are you kind of, as, are you finding, you know, obviously your philosophy and your message, are you finding yeah. that you are starting to, starting to get reach in ways where it's not just about you, we have a therapist and that are actually shifting as well. Yeah. So uh, with patients, with the general public, yeah. I have influence. And with my your clinic, results are showing. Yes. Yeah. And so with my clinic, my orthopedic clinic I had here in Denver, I trained all of my new therapists in this approach. And so then they got it. And so, yes, I was very successful there. 
but and I've just created an online training program to teach other therapists this approach too. But my belief isn't that it should just be physical therapists. We're not the only one who deals with mm-hmm. people with movement and pain. You as a coach do, yeah, yeah. you know, personal trainers, Pilates yeah. instructors, yoga. So my information is geared towards not having all of this scientific medical knowledge and spewing out all of this complicated stuff. Look, you guys are often the first people who see people with pain. Yeah. And so my program is also geared towards people like you to understand because you guys can nip it in the bud yeah. before it becomes chronic and then put me out of work, which I would be more than happy to be put yeah. out of work for. So that's, uh, that's kind of my mission is to not only reach physical therapists, but anyone in that whole yeah. spectrum, coaches, any touch point, yeah, any touch point, anyone who's dealing with someone with pain and movement, this information is transformative. Okay. So, so where do people find you? What, 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 are, you know, what, what do you do? We, you know, give me the plug. Sure. Sure. Um, well, if people are interested in my downloadable home programs to solve their pain, they can go to www.fixingyoumethod.com. And that's, those are video programs that include a lot of things, changing habits, tighter, weak muscles, taping techniques, all sorts of things. If you're a practitioner who wants to learn this approach to solving pain, uh, you can go to healpatientsfaster.com. And then if you, I have some free stuff on my, my central website, which is rickolderman.com. There's a ebook, my blog, my podcast and things like that. But if you type in fixing you all one word on the products that you, you might buy from me, you can get a 20% discount. So that'll help. Uh, any, anything else just before we wrap up? No, I just, uh, you know, do you have any questions is, would no, be my question no, about no. any specific client that you have that you're struggling with? No, not really at this moment. Um, no, I did have a back operation myself last year. I did have severe bulging discs, but, um, I've been, mm-hmm. I'm very lucky, um, because I'm mid forties, I've pushed my body extremely hard for years. Yeah. But I think structurally I'm, I'm very good. Like I, my good. body, you know, I, I seem to be able to. You know, I never really seem to get major injuries. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and, and, but yeah, no, but that was more just a freak kind of accident than anything. Yeah. Oh, got yeah. it. Well, I'm glad that was successful for you. Yeah, 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 yeah same. And it makes you back to 100%, which is really lovely because I thought there might be, I kind of thought there might be a compromise afterwards. You know, I thought, you know, mm-hmm. I won't ever get to that. And even the surgeon right. said you won't quite get to 100, but actually I kind of feel I am. So surgery yeah. can be the right choice. Yeah. And, and it was like, I was like, I was yeah. debilitated, you know? Yeah. I'm not yeah. anti-surgery at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm anti-surgery if you haven't tried solving the system problem. Yeah. Though. Yeah. And if surgery fails, it's usually because you haven't solved the si- system. Yeah, yeah. So no, but yeah, no, 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 that, that's great. Well, thank you for coming on the show. And um, yeah. I'll put a link to those websites in the show notes. Uh, you want to check out Rick's work, you can go there and do that and uh, keep up the good work, mate. Nice to meet you, you too. Radio tips. So hopefully you got something from Rick there. So it was pretty interesting stuff. Um, also pretty big claims. I'll be interested to see some of my listeners who are more physiotherapists and stuff. I know Anna Dungey is a pretty legendary physio herself. So I'll be interested to see her feedback. Uh, he obviously has a, a pretty high level of knowledge and, you know, so yeah, I, it was interesting. It was a good interview. I'll put all his stuff in, all his info in the show notes. You can check out the show notes. So there we go. Anyway, I'll be back in a couple of weeks from now. I just want to say thank you, first of all, for those who have supported the book. If you haven't got the book, two things to remember. When you get the book, if you go to passionaboutexercise.com and you get the book, um, you also get 12 free workouts which are designed for beginner exercises and my seven day goal setting course and this is a goal setting course what I thought the problem with goal setting is most people don't do it and that's because there's so much effort involved so I wanted to create a goal setting course where you did it over seven days and each day the way I did it was basically each day you watch a video that's about five minutes long and I just asked you some couple hard questions and then you have to make a video so you grab your phone you just answer the questions or you think about the questions for a day then the next 24 hours later, you, you make this video which kind of goes through these questions and that takes a few minutes and the next day you watch another video and you do that process for six days. So it basically gets you to explore some really big questions about yourself or where you want to grow as a person, but kind of in the easiest way possible where you just watch a quick video, you think about something for a period of time and then you make a quick video yourself. 
And then on day six, that's when you book out a couple of hours to do your goal setting. And I do a longer video which takes you through that goal setting process where I talk you through the questions, the things you need to explore. So at the end of day six, you actually have a plan in place. And then day seven, we're just talking about the goal awareness tools. And that's what are you going to do to make sure you keep the goals in the forefront of your mind moving forward towards goal achievement. And this course, I'm actually really proud of it. I think it's a really cool little goal setting course. And you get it free when you get my book. So first of all, if you're someone who's already exercising, well, you know, this, this goal setting course is worth more than the book in itself. Um, secondly, you can then just pass the book on to somebody in your life who you think will get value from it. Uh, thirdly, if you need the book yourself, you get that, you get the workouts, and you get the book. So that's pretty cool as well. So I've tried to do it so that you don't just get the book, you also get some pretty cool deals. So yeah, so check it out. Go to passionaboutexercise.com to get my book. Also, Again, can you please write a review on Amazon or Audible if you do get the book? It just helps me get those review numbers up because it's cool that it's so high up the ratings. But I often think that if you only got two or three reviews, that people might go, oh, I'm not sure. Whereas if you've got you know, 50 to 100 reviews, that should be possible. And you know, the amount of listeners of this podcast and the amount of you that have bought the book, which I know is way more than 50, um, that would help. You know, so I know it takes a couple of minutes, but I really, really treasure it. Just think, by me putting a review up, I might be helping others love exercise. Anyway, that's this week's show done and dusted. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode of the Bevan James Iowa Show. As always, keep being you. 